Hello, my name is Mark Watts. I'm a partner here at the Bristow's IT and data protection team. And I'm Helen Rose and I'm an associate at Bristow's. And we're going to talk today about big data and touch on some of the issues that raises. So we've been talking about this quite a bit. And I think one of the things that we've, we both now agree on is that a lot of the stuff out there that's described as big data probably isn't big data. It's yeah. just been around for ages and um, it's really just data analytics. So why don't we try and define big data just at the, at the start before we go much further. What does big data mean for you? Well, I guess it, big data to me is the idea, first of all, that you've got so much more data now than uh, used to be the case. So you've got huge quantities of data coming from various different sources and accumulating very rapidly. Um, but secondly, it's the fact that we've now got the technology to make use of that data and to analyse it and store it and process it in a way that means that you can draw valuable conclusions from it and spot patterns in it that maybe a, a human analyst couldn't. Yeah, that is sometimes very surprising. So mm. you might have a database over here with certain information collected in certain circumstances and used for one purpose and data over here and over here, all used for different purposes. Mm. Um, and then you put it together and do some clever maths on it and computing on it and out pops a result that nobody would have anticipated mm. um, looking just at those individual data sets. So we've been talking about various examples of those. Yeah. Um, I know you like the uh, the babies example. What, yeah. So what, what's that all about then? Well that's um, uh, some work that I think IBM did with a hospital in the US and they had um, monitors recording the vital signs of premature babies that were on monitors, um, I think, um, a thousand times a second. Right. And so that data was being captured, but it wasn't um, stored for long. And they sort of looked at it and thought, well, if we start storing this and then can look back retrospectively and analyse it using algorithms that can see patterns in it, we might be able to um, make decisions about how we treat um, patients in future. So right. using um, the algorithms and the analysis, they were able to see that, in fact, although you'd expect that babies which are going to develop a particular infection would show sort of distress signs, uh, one predictor that the baby was going to develop an infection was that more that its um, sort of vital signs were too regular. So right. it's something that wouldn't necessarily have, have alarmed a doctor, but they were able to spot this pattern and then use it to um, take proactive um, measures in future. It's a good example. The, uh, one of the other examples that caught my eye was the one about um, looking at conflicts and how they move and um, people breaching ceasefires and, mm. and things like that. So there's been quite a bit of work looking at, I mean, th one of the obvious ones is probably not big data actually, is looking at social media mm. data and seeing how the postings and content on social media maybe show how conflicts are erupting in various parts of a country but on a similar example that probably is more big data is this idea that um, you can maybe get early warnings of troop movements and things like that mm. because as as say an army moves into a particular town the first thing it does maybe is to turn off electricity and other utilities mm. and that gets picked up in terms of data yeah. Um, and it just gives you a, a, an early warning, if you like, that maybe troops are being moved around and maybe that's going to lead to a conflict. Um, and, you know, who would have thought that data yeah. about electricity supply and, and all the sort of normal purposes around that would suddenly be over here being available to tell people valuable information about conflicts and wars and, yeah. and so on. It's a good example of it being slightly surprising, I, yeah. I think. Okay, so. Some of the stuff that people have written about big data, particularly looking at it in terms of data privacy, is that there are things that you can do when you process data and, and analytics that you can apply that will result in a conclusion about them, perhaps, as an mm -hmm. individual, or a correlation, perhaps, that may be relevant to them as an individual that people find a bit creepy. Mm. Um, so there is this whole piece about, well, maybe there's a good side to big data, all the societal goods that we talked about, yeah. you know, curing babies and all that sort of thing. But maybe there's a dark side as well that mm. perhaps you can find out things about people, and they don't, you know, they don't know you're even looking. Yeah. Um, and maybe they don't know that a decision affecting them was taken on the basis of this sort of analysis. So it's, so I think there probably are some challenges. Yeah. For um, how it complies with EU data protection rules, at least as they stand at the moment. Yeah. 
I mean, I guess trying to think about the, the kind of examples of uses of big data that people might find you know, sort of creepy. Yeah. Um, I guess there's some um, media reporting about using the idea that you'd have a, a car which would have sensors um, in it that would um, enable people to market to you and maybe they'd also use your mobile phone mm -hmm. um, and do location data derived from that to basically um, market um, sort of vouchers or offers for shops that are near the, um, the locations that you're in. Yes. So you know, it might also be giving you directions or telling you that there's traffic coming up. Yeah. It might be really useful, but in another way, firstly, people might not necessarily be interested in the marketing, and secondly, they might not like the idea that so much data about where they're going and when yep. and how quickly um, is being collected if they don't understand how it's going to be used. Yes, yes. No, you're right. People have got quite exercised about that. And one of the other areas where they've got ex exercised about, um, and there's a lot of discussion about big data, is its usefulness to insurance companies. Mm. So, for example, you could, you potentially, you could take various data sets about um, somebody's lack of gym membership or attendance, what they're <laughs> buying, the fact they buy lots of really fatty foods, mm. um, the size of the clothes that they buy, yeah. and you could, putting that all together, you could derive some conclusions about how unhealthy they are maybe, right. um, that could, if you're an insurance company, you might think about using that to put their premium up or yeah. um, refuse insurance cover potentially yeah. or limit the, the level of cover, that kind of thing. So that that's an area where people have got quite excited because they think that's wrong. Yeah. I think one of the things that's interesting about it is whether it really whether it ha well, in what way is it different to if say you have to have a medical as yeah. part of getting an insur health insurance policy, which is pretty commonplace. Um, it's just another way of getting perhaps the same or similar information, but by a different route. Yeah. But it's, uh, to me, it shows that how you get the information, whether it's through a formal medical where the person participates and knows about it and goes to the doctor and has all the assurances around that, as opposed to the data, just data that they may not know about being used yeah. to reach the same conclusion. Um, yeah, I think one the degree of creepiness is partly about yeah. the transparency involved right. and that's what right. makes it different from agreeing right. to go for a medical. Yes. Yes. Um, and I guess the other thing is the extent to which you can draw an accurate conclusion from aggregated data about individuals who have those yes. traits or have bought those kind of things, um, whether it's accurate to say that that person has a higher risk um, yes. from a health insurance point of view. Well, it's because it's um, inevitably what you're dealing with here are statistics. So yeah. if, I, if in my insurance example, if I have a medical and my, um, you know, weight, lifestyle, diet, and all the rest of it, things that are particular to me are actually measured and factored into mm. my a decision about me to do with insurance. I'm not, I'm not saying there's not issues with that necessarily, there are, but, mm. but if you just take that for an example, as an example, um, then they are about me. Mm. Whereas if the same conclusions are reached based on not having met me and given me a medical, mm. but simply from knowing that I'm of a, you know, I'm, I have a, I'm a certain age, I have a certain lifestyle, and I fit into a certain demographic, mm -hmm. then while statistically it may be more likely that those conclusions are as valid as if I'd had the medical, um, it's not necessarily the case. Yeah. And I think that's, that's where unfairness potentially may creep in, because it's the difference between treating people really as an individual yeah. and treating them as one of a crowd, albeit perhaps a statistically quite small crowd that mm -hmm. may approximate to them as an individual. And then do you think that suggests that maybe there's a limit to which data privacy law is going to protect people from unfairness associated with use of big data potentially? That it's not that the difficulty is that the information isn't personal enough. Yeah, it could be. I mean, it. it I think it raises all sorts of questions. Um, it may be that there comes a point where the data is so good, mm. and the statistics so overwhelmingly um, in one direction that it becomes, in my example, almost as if I did have a medical. It's just mm. that accurate. 
I think that's one um, one aspect. I think the other aspect is we talk of, talk about it in terms of fairness. Mm. That may not necessarily be fairness in terms of the data processing itself. Yeah. It may be fairness in, for example, the business model of the insurance company. Yeah. The, their decision to base and price their policies on this information, mm. that aggregate statistical information, as opposed to personal information yeah. about the individual, that may be unfair. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that all the data processing involved um, in doing big data is unfair processing in a data protection context, yeah. if, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that um, we've read about uh, occasionally is peop people having these, uh, these headlines like, it's the end of data protection as we know it, or mm. the big data tsunami is the end of privacy, and so on. So there is, people, people are writing a lot about this sort of awkwardness in fit between mm. what big data is all about and what it does, and the laws we have it in Europe at the moment yeah. in terms of consent and fairness and notice and purpose limitation and so on. Um, so it'd be good to talk about that really, is, to, is it really as bad as some people would have you believe. Yeah, because I guess if thinking about the purpose aspect, I guess the argument is that part of the value of big data analytics comes from taking data that was collected for one purpose and maybe combining it with other data to look at it for a different purpose. Yeah. Um, and I suppose the difficulty from a data protection perspective then comes from the idea that you've told someone maybe we'll use your personal data for marketing purposes and we might disclose it for marketing purposes and that doesn't really get the individual very far in understanding how their data is going to be used if there's a very complex chain of yes. service providers yes. and data brokers behind the scenes uh, it, it's not very meaningful but yes I so I mean so to say take a um, a more a slightly more extreme example. Say you've got data that's being collected mm. for therapeutic purposes. So patients' expectation is that it will be used to treat them and make them better mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. And they would have consented to that either expressly or you know implied consent or whatever. And then you want to take that data and use it to develop pharmaceuticals or mm -hmm. price drugs or decide what drugs should be available on the NHS or, or whatever. Mm. Um, that really is a purpose that's quite remote, potentially, from that original purpose of yeah. therapeutic use of their information. So I think a lot of companies try and, a lot, a lot of organisations deal with this, this change of purpose by trying to handle the information in an anonymous way. Yeah. So it's not personal data anymore. Yeah. But I think there's probably a few challenges with that. Yeah, I think so, because I think often you see big data written about and there's a lot of discussion of it being anonymous and aggregated but yes. it, it's not necessarily the case that very much analysis has gone into what anonymous really means or anonymization really means yes. and I guess the very availability of analytics techniques and, and means that anonymization is more and more difficult so you might yes. have for example I think there have been cases in the US where there have been DNA sequences that have been obtained from volunteers for research that have been made publicly available on the internet on the understanding that those were anonymous and it wouldn't be possible to identify the individuals who'd given the DNA yes. sequences. Yes. But um, as time has m moved on and technology's moved on, people have been able to take those publicly available DNA sequences, combine them with other data, so maybe from genealogy websites um, and maybe the, the individual's age and the state they're from yeah. and actually identify that person by name or identify that person to within two individuals. Yes. So We saw a similar thing when the AOL search results mm. or search terms, when that file was inadvertently disclosed a few years ago. And then similarly, when, th when Netflix ran their competition to improve their uh, recommendations algorithm and mm. they released a sample of anonymous data um, about how people had rated various films that they'd mm. watched, people were, as you say, a applying enough computing power yeah. were, were, we able, were able to reverse out the identities of some of the individuals involved. Mm. I think some of the stuff about anonymization and how big data is such a big threat to anonymization does depend on what you mean by anonymization. Mm. And so 
some of the stuff that's been um, written on this, I, I can't help thinking that it approaches the issue in terms of personally identifiable information, or PII, a very yeah. US-centric mm -hmm. approach to anonymization. And you know, there have been some examples where people would say, well, it's not PII, it's anonymous, because we've yeah. taken off the names and the job titles. Yeah. But that leaves that still leaves rather a lot of information that over here, in, in the EU, for example, mm. we'd still consider personal data. Yeah, well, and I guess the idea also that regardless of whether it's strictly speaking personal data, if you've got enough information to affect someone, um, even if you can identify them mm. in real life, if, if you have collected enough information about them and can mark it to them without necessarily knowing Don't their online, name. Online, for example, exactly. so if you could serve them ads or send them some sort of or treat them differently yeah. because of the information you know about them even if you couldn't identify and identify who they are in the real world mm. so that you could go up and shake their hand yeah that's still some say identified enough mm. to be personal data one of the other things i've i've um heard people suggest is that well because of this threat to anonymization and because potentially any data with enough analytics mm. could be linked to an individual and so could be considered personal data mm. maybe we should scrap the definition of personal data and just treat all data as personal data right. which um, <laughs> um, seems a bit well I don't know defeatist or mm. counterproductive to me because yeah. if there's n if everything's going to be personal data then there's no incentive to take any steps to minimize the extent to which people are identified yeah. because it's it's all personal data anyway so why bother even trying to de-identify it or right. make it quasi-anonymous do you yeah. see what I mean? Yeah you've just got this whole mass of data that all has to be treated as carefully as yes. possible so yes. um, what's the point in, in yes. doing anything with it? So one of, the, one of the other things that I think is, is quite interesting here is um, in Europe there's quite a strong tradition less so in the UK but more in the other countries of basing processing on informed consent yeah. and that's something that seems to be getting stronger under the proposed regulation I would say mm -hmm. that you need you need consent that need that means that people need to know what they're consenting to yeah. so how do people consent to say well the, the baby's example doesn't quite work but um, if we're talking about a surprising secondary use of data yeah. that people nobody was going to foresee how can you tell people about it so that they can consent to it? Yeah. So it's a bit of a, a challenge. Yeah, and, and the idea that you'd have to go back to the people from whom you collected the data, or it might have been collected by a third party even anyway. If, even if you could. It makes life difficult. Yes, yeah, I mean, you may not even be able to get in contact with them. You may have no means of being able to go back and, um, and get their consent. Mm. And I think some of these, some of the examples, some of the really compelling examples of big data mm. like this is where your baby's one is a good example mm. I think um, perhaps the the societal good from it yeah. is so significant and the potential intrusion or harm to a particular individual is mm. so small that um, one needs to say well you don't need consent yeah. you can do the processing um, it's for the greater good provided always that it doesn't have any negative consequences on a particular individual. So some people are saying, yeah. well, maybe, maybe consent isn't the way forward for big data, uh, and everything will be big data soon. Maybe mm. consent is just not the way forward for yeah. data protection. Yeah, but maybe particularly where you're doing research that has uh, yeah. for non-commercial purposes. So to yes. some extent, there's copyright exceptions yep. to allow um, research use anyway. Yes. And the government's looking at extending the extent to which those apply um, for uh, analytical research. Yes, and we got the same idea in data protection ter terms, as you know, where there's an exception or a group of exceptions that allow you to do certain types of statistical research and analysis mm. for scientific or economic purposes, or that sort of thing, big data-like analytics. Mm. Um, you can do that as long as it doesn't result in an individual being taken about a specific, in, sorry, a decision being taken about a specific individual. Right. But I suppose there's the idea that you could do the analysis, so say in the insurance company example, and you're not directly using the information about the individual to make a decision yeah. that affects that individual, but 
the outcome of the analysis of the aggregated data might still affect the individual in a negative way. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that is a challenge mm. as to whether that, is that even processing data for a different purpose if it yeah. started it off being non- data? Yeah, right, because yeah. it might, it might, as we were saying, it might well be done mm. on an aggregate or anonymous basis. Mm. Um, you mentioned some of the copyright yeah. aspects of this. So we we spent a lot of time talking about the data privacy issues, mm. but um, to the extent these are assets yeah. and it's data, there's an awful lot of IP rights in yeah. play here and a lot of complexity. Mm. So I imagine it's quite a few IP challenges as well. Yes, and I guess it's a, a bit more complex than just licensing one data set because often, as we've discussed, the value in the big data world comes from putting together lots of different data sets. Yes. So not only do you have different data sets from different sources, so it might be uh, data that you've developed internally, data that you've licensed in from third parties, publicly available data, um, data gathered from social media. So you've got all these different sources, but then on top of that, you've got all the different rights that might subsist in each of those data sets. So copyright, database right, um, maybe trademarks, maybe rights and confidential information. And various copyrights, I guess, that yeah. could be copyrights, copyright in the structures of the database, yeah. the reports, yeah. the individual items, yeah. if they're you know, documents or you know, whatever they might be, works of art, whatever. Yeah, exactly. So, and I guess the other complexity is that there's, well, there are different criteria for subsistence and infringement for each of those different rights. And the rights will vary from country to country, and often yeah. the, the data will have been created in different parts of the world or on a or by the internet, so that it's coming from all over the world. So there's there's quite a lot to think about. Um, but it's doable, though. It's it's yeah, it's 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 kind of just a due diligence exercise, like any other due diligence exercise, and a case of determining what you've got, where it came from, and where it's going. Yeah, what rights you've got to use it. You know what rights do you need from the service provider that might be doing the analysis for you um, and making sure that you can do what you want to with the output data as well. So overall, if we have to sum up, uh, big data, yeah. on the whole a good thing, yeah. can be creepy depending on some of the um, correlations that can be mm. derived and how they are used, if they're, particularly if they're used to make decisions negatively impacting individuals. Mm. Um, some significant compliance challenges with existing EU data protection laws. Yeah. Um, and there's quite a bit of work to do on the IP side by the sound of it. Yeah. But again, um, all doable. Yeah. I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for listening.